show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join me, Mark White, here on GB News. For more than two decades, I've been at the sharp end of reporting crime and security at home and abroad. From the scourge of terrorism to the fight against violent crime and the deepening small boats crisis in the channel, they're issues you rightly care about, and so do I. As GB News Home and Security Editor, my focus will be on the stories that matter to you. Hello there, I'm Eamon. And I'm Isabel. And you're watching the GB News digital stream across the United Kingdom. And around the world. If you're here in the UK, you can also watch us on your TV screen. GB News is Freeview Channel 236. On Sky, we're Channel 515. 626 on Virgin Media. Just remember, you might need to retune your TV to watch the channel. Yeah, and if you are doing that, find out more about retuning by going to gbnews.uk. Join my show, Farrar, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farrar's. Good morning, it's 9.30 and this is The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood. Today we'll be dissecting a big non-announcement last night from number 10, Keir Starmer's pitch to Patriots and Sadiq Khan's tentative drug reform pilots. All that and more to come, but first, it's time for the headlines. Good morning, it's half past nine. Let's get you up to date with me, Rosie Wright. Coronavirus testing rules are set to be relaxed in England. Asymptomatic people who test positive for coronavirus on a lateral flow test will no longer have to wait for a confirmation on a PCR test to begin their official self-isolation. It's part of new measures the government are set to introduce to try and combat COVID-related staff shortages in the workplace. The self-isolation time is 10 days, with people able to exit a week after a week if they test negative on separate tests taken on days 6 and 7. Airline bosses are calling for testing requirements for international travellers to be scrapped. Research commissioned by Airlines UK and Manchester Airports Group suggests the tests make little difference in reducing the spread of Omicron. Now it's the dominant variant in the UK. Industry leaders report that the pre-departure -te testing requirements cause passenger numbers to plummet by 30%. Hospitals in Greater Manchester have postponed some non-urgent surgeries amid staff shortages because of COVID. At least six hospital trusts have declared critical incidents, meaning priority services may be under threat. The Prime Minister acknowledged parts of the NHS may feel overwhelmed in the coming days. In Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon is going to address the Scottish Parliament later on today on any possible changes to restrictions. The First Minister is going to speak at 2pm. Opposition parties have called for the 10-day isolation period to be cut to seven if someone tests negative twice. A memorial for the victims of the Manchester Arena bombing attack opens today. It's called the Glade of Light. It's a white marble halo that bears the names of the 22 people killed at an Ariana Grande concert in May of 2017. Families who lost loved ones have been able to put memory capsules inside the halo. You're up to date. I'll be back with more for you at 10 o'clock. Right now, back to Tom and the briefing. Welcome to The Briefing. It's 9.35 and I'm Tom Harwood here on GB News TV and now your Radio 2. 
Well, now to that big story of the day. Boris attempted to stamp his authority last night with one of those ominous press conferences. The announcements within it, however, were less than seismic. The Prime Minister wants 100,000 critical workers to take daily tests in order to enable the smooth running of the country through the Omicron wave without the need for more restrictions. Well, here's a little reminder of what he had to say. Anyone who thinks our battle with Covid is over, I'm afraid, is profoundly wrong. This is a moment for the utmost caution. Together with the Plan B measures that we introduced before Christmas, we have a chance to ride out this Omicron wave without shutting down our country once again. We can keep our schools and our businesses open and we can find a way to live with this virus. Well, meanwhile, some hospitals across the country are declaring critical incidents as hospitalizations rise and staff levels fall. Well, joining me to talk through what this news conference was really all about and look ahead to the Prime Minister's questions later on today at 3pm is Conservative commentator Alex Dean. Welcome to the programme, Alex. Um, I suppose, Welcome. first of all, this was a big conference uh, a big, scary conference when it was announced earlier in the day that didn't really announce all that much at all. What was really the motivation behind this? Well, I, I agree with you. When you hear the words that the Prime Minister's got a presser at five o'clock, uh, there's a little part of you dies, isn't it? And you think to yourself, oh, gosh, we're going to have some new restrictions. I suppose, and that wasn't the case, of, of course, uh, with this conference. I suppose part of the purpose of this um, press conference was to reassure us that the government believes that we are on the right track, that the Plan B measures announced and debated in Parliament are enough uh, to deal with the newish Omicron variant and that we don't need further restrictions, which is, of course, a question significantly on people's minds in the Westminster Parliament, because in all of the devolved regions, they've got different measures to those experienced currently in England. So we've got a Parliament in members of parliament represent areas that have different rules to the ones on which the Westminster Parliament voted. You can understand why it's front of mind. But you do run the risk as a government of falling into the nothing has changed, Theresa May style uh, press conferences when the prime minister of that day would make announcements without actually saying anything. I don't think that's what this was. I think that it was a reasonable thing to do to reassure people that the government thinks we're on the right track. After all, of course, SAGE told us we might be up to 2 million cases a day uh, by now. So their um, bad scenario was at least nine tenths uh, worse than the reality faced today. So I don't think it was as bad as that, Tom. But you do run that risk in communications. And I don't think government's going to be doing that all that often. Yeah, I think it's fairly fair to say that the peak, or at least that dreaded potential Omicron peak, has been levelled off. Significant behaviour change and potentially something endemic within the virus contributing to that. Um, I wonder how much this was less about the virus and more about the Prime Minister's political situation, the need to demonstrate that he had his hand on the tiller, turning up in a national press conference with uh, a smarter haircut than he's had in several months, trying to really show that he's the guy who's in charge. To what extent do you think that this was more of a political than uh, a virus-centred move? It was definitely a political press conference, albeit I must say I think historians will look back and have many questions about our age, not least why did we spend so much time analysing the hair of one of our leading <laughs> politicians? It's extraordinary the amount of time we, we dedicate to it. But yes, I agree with you. It was a, a political conference. And not least I think what it said was we've had a reset over Christmas Government is now back. We are back on an even keel. We, there was a kind of implicit acknowledgement here, I, I think, that, yes, you rebelled uh, before the Christmas break. We listened. You know, there was some messaging to the backbenchers here. Mm. We're not going any further with restrictions uh, on society. We're not going to have anything more. So I, mm. from that perspective, I agree with you. It was a political press conference. But I suppose the question that this begs were um, you thinking about it from the perspective of one of those Tory sceptics in the House of Commons. I suppose the question you would have watching it is, what about the things that the executive is doing uh, that we don't get to vote on? Most significantly, the work from home um, advice that we are currently under. Because, Tom, I think one of the interesting things is people think we've got a political elite, a political class that's all the same. When it comes to coronavirus, you have the full spectrum of opinion 
in the House of Commons, from people who think we're not going far enough and we should be locking down a great deal more, from people who want to scrap everything and go back to inverted commas normal tomorrow or preferably yesterday. You know, and those people, you can't, you can't please that entire group. But in the group that Boris is concerned about, those Tory backbenches, they'll be watching this thinking to themselves, I'm glad you're not going any further, but when are we going to start opening up again? Mm, I suppose that'll be a question to which, uh, which will be put to the Prime Minister after 3pm today. Of course, we have Prime Minister's questions and then a statement to the House. The Prime Minister will be on his feet behind that dispatch box for quite some time this afternoon. Yeah. How do you expect him to be received by the House? I don't think the Prime Minister will be asked when are we going to start opening up again. I think Keir Starmer's raison d'etre now in the House is to say, why aren't you doing more and preferably I'd have done what you did uh, this month, last month, uh, it is the Starmer's um, modus operandi. I think Boris is actually going to be greeted with great positivity from his own back benches. I think this is an opportunity now for the Tory party to say, we had our internal differences, we've come back after Christmas, we feel like we're in the right place and we'd certainly prefer to remain in government, we certainly prefer to remain behind you, uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson, than we would to see Keir Starmer in government. And I suppose the other interesting thing that's going to be uh, on the minds of some viewers, at least, is what the position taken by MPs for those devolved regions might be. Because, of course, if you're a Scottish MP, whether you're SNP or not, you are representing a region that has significantly more strict rules on coronavirus uh, than England. Some people will want to crow about that and say it's the right thing. Some people will want to say, you know, help us, Boris. Can't you stop uh, Nicola Sturgeon shutting us down? I mean, at one point, Tom, there was one patient in Scotland uh, receiving intensive care treatment because of Omicron. Nicola Sturgeon's response to one patient in intensive care seems to be to nail crooked pieces of wood across the windows and set fire to the economy to keep herself warm. Uh, there has to be a point at which you... Uh, you lessen restrictions. And some of the Scottish MPs, I think, this is their opportunity now to demonstrate where they stand. Interesting to hear what they have to say in the House of Commons later today. And, of course, Nicola Sturgeon also speaking today. No doubt we will bring that on GB News as well. But for now, Alex Dean, thank you very much for joining us this morning Thanks, on Tom. The Briefing. Now, Labour leader Sakir Starmer said he would restore trust in the government if he was elected Prime Minister, taking a less than subtle swipe at the scandals that dogged the government in recent months. Here's a quick snippet of his big speech yesterday. The vast majority of MPs care about our democracy and they honour that trust. They don't earn millions from foreign governments. They don't use the proxy vote rules to bunk off to the Caribbean and they don't lobby government because they've been paid to do so. Instead, they just go about their job, trying to make sure that our laws are written in the best interests of their constituents and of the country. But those MPs have been let down. And more importantly, so have the British people because the corruption scandal that's engulfed the Tory party is corroding trust in our parliament and in the belief that politics is a force for good. Keir Starmer there. Now, he went on to insist that Labour is still a deeply patriotic party whose electoral successes and indeed leaders who've won elections, Attlee, Wilson and Blair, enacted reforms that were rooted in the everyday concerns of working people. Noticeably absent from his speech was any mention of other predecessors of his. Notably, uh, the man on whose front bench he served for half a decade, Jeremy Corbyn. Well, can Starmer convince the public his party has changed? Joining me now in the studio to discuss this is Stephen Pound, the former Labour MP for Ealing North. Welcome to the programme. Um, Keir Starmer stood in front of two mm. big union flags. Mm -hmm. He spoke about how Attlee uh, initiated NATO, set up mm -hmm. our trident, or, or at least our, our initial nuclear mm -hmm. deterrent. Mm -hmm. Are the public listening? I don't know. I'm not the public. But all, all I can say is that the people I've spoken to, you know, using the old dog and duck test, is that people actually felt that he was a person who was being pretty serious and who was showing that patriotism is, is not the exclusive property of one particular group of people in this country. And that we know, we're, we're all patriots in this country in, in various forms. I think that the people will listen to this. But above all, what they will hear 
is somebody who's actually fairly staid, fairly quiet, fairly sober, fairly serious, mm. who is quite simply saying to the British people, I will not lie to you. That's mm. what it was about. It wasn't a shopping list. It wasn't a wish list. It was a statement of intent. And on that, 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 that level, I think it worked. Indeed, from the Labour left, we've heard a lot of criticism that there hasn't been a lot of policy um, put forward. But I suppose that, that we are halfway through a political term. We might not necessarily expect to see a, a shopping list of policy, as, as, you, as you say there. Um, those values that were set out in, so in terms of uh, security and, and, and trust, and actually prosperity was an interesting yeah. one that he mentioned as well. Um, are those going to lead to policy? And, and, and when would you su suggest that well, might yeah. happen? Security, prosperity and respect was mm. what he, uh, with the, the three ones he came up with. And I, I think th those are pretty key ones. But you've got to actually unpack them a little bit. When he talks about security, he's actually talking about the security of health services. He's talking about the security of employment. He's talking about the security of national insurance. He's talking about that sort of security. And when he talks to prosperity, he actually talks about funding and, and assisting to fund you know, small and medium enterprises, the future, and talks about people moving, you know, from sort of to a carbon neutral economy where people can actually make a lot of money out of making things like wind farms instead of you know the, the more uh, dangerous items. So I think it was pretty damned impressive from that. Mm. So the, the question is, and you've absolutely put your finger on it, we're not, not even two years away from the next election. The next election is not due till May, you know, 2024. You do not put all your fruit out on the stall here and now. We don't actually put all your particular options out. Firstly, because we don't know what on earth the world's going to be like. You and I. Didn't, well, you might, but I certainly didn't know what the world was going to be like two years ago today. Mm. And in two years, who knows where we are? So you don't actually set your stall out now. The other reason why you don't do it is, you know, why give the other side all the ideas and all the ammunition they want? What we would heard from Keir yesterday, and I think it did resonate, certainly with the government, because the government then brought forward, you know, their press conference, which was most unusual, you know, to try to upstage it. And they brought mm. all the, 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 the hounds of hell out in the papers today trying to destroy it. So I think that simple message that... Trust us, we're not going to lie to you. It's going to be a different sort of policy. It's not going to be razzmatazz, it's not going to be slam bang, it's all going to be fireworks. Mm. It's going to be quiet and it's going to be serious and it's going to be sensible and above all, it's going to be respectful. Now, Keir Starmer has a difficult job on his hands, of course. He's <laughs> leading in the polls at the moment, although that seems to be more due to unforced errors mm. of the government rather than anything the Labour Party has proactively done. He's been the benefit of certain stories in the Daily Mirror. He's been the benefit of, to some extent, Marcus Rashford. He's been the benefit of uh, the Conservative Party trying to save a mate and change rules over standards. Um, is anything he can do going, going to actually deliver or at least prolong that lead if it wasn't himself that created it in the first place. That's a horribly good point, and I, I wish you hadn't made it. <laughs> uh, because it, it's one that Keir himself actually picked up on. He said, look, it's not enough to be the, the, the not-so-unpopular not party. Mm. And you know, it's an old truism, as you know, that, politi that parties don't win elections, the other party loses them. You know, we've, we've seen that many, many times. I think he actually recognised that, and he took that on head-on. He actually said that. But he's not going to actually come up, you know, with the, you know, the wish list here and now. It, the simple message that came across yesterday was a statement of intent it was a promise. And he was actually talking you know, about a covenant with the, with the people. It was actually a commitment, and which comes down to those simple words. I'm not going to lie to you. Mm. I wonder to what extent people will think mm. that what Keir Starmer is saying now sounds very good, sounds mm. very, um, some might say centrist, some might say patriotic. Mm. Um, but it also sounds very different to the Keir Starmer who was speaking two years ago when he stood to become Labour leader. Mm -hmm. where he promised uh, a raft of nationalisations, mm -hmm. where he said he would defend Jeremy Corbyn's legacy, where he promised to protect freedom of movement mm -hmm. with the EU. He seems to have U-turned on all of those points. Well, not all of them. There's a certain thing of collective responsibility. I mean, I was on Jeremy Corbyn's front bench for a long, long time, um, you know, and I actually supported Owen Smith when he stood against Jeremy. Mm. But the fact is, when I was on the front bench, you know, you, you don't actually... Um... But this is when he was standing to be leader. Yeah, yeah. OK, yeah, a fair point. When he was standing as leader, he talked about things like the public ownership of the utilities, which mm. I happen to think is a damn sensible idea, and I think most people would nowadays. But, you know, that was at that particular time he was talking about that, and that was his intention. And when what he carries out in consultation with the wider party, we will see in the, in the fullness of time. I take your point, though, that the, the, the direction of travel is slightly different now as it was mm. two years ago. But on the other hand, the world's different as it was, than it was two years ago. Very different place. I wonder if that same excuse that works for the Prime Minister might well work for Keir Starmer as well. I'm afraid we've run out of time <laughs> in this conversation, but Stephen Pound for now, thank you very much for joining us this morning on The Briefing on GB News. Well, Parliament is back this afternoon for its first sitting of the new year.
While the agenda today is low-key, the task of the next months for this administration is vast. Nervous MPs have been anxiously waiting, watching the polls. For many of them, uh, for many of the over 100 first-term Conservative MPs on those green benches, the end of last year represented the first time their party has been significantly behind in the polls since their election over two years ago. And nervous backbenchers make for jittery government. Whilst last night's press conference saw a Prime Minister clearly attempting to show his hand back on that tiller, today's Prime Minister's questions at the later time of 3pm this afternoon will present Boris's first opportunity this year to speak to much of his party. The Prime Minister stumbled through November and December with a series of unforced errors, pursuing retrospective rule changes over parliamentary standards to save a mate from a 30-day suspension. And then you turning a 100 strong Tory rebellion over Plan B vaccine passport measures, an unnecessary by election calamity, and the drip, drip, drip of stories about various lockdown gatherings in number 10. The papers were practically swimming in wine and cheese. But this is a new year. Those stories have had the opportunity to fade into the distance, but only if they're replaced by a positive agenda. The Prime Minister holding firm over not following those troublesome, restrictive paths of Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales, is already winning him back some respect. But in truth, it is a legislative agenda that could be the key to moving the needle. As things stand, this government has little to boast about. The public are tired of hearing that Brexit got done, and that poll bounce from the country's undeniable vaccine success story has long since passed. For many, next year presents a troublesome smorgasbord of tax rises, energy price hikes, NHS waiting lists, inflation and a continuing housing crisis. This government has to prove it has an agenda to combat that spectre. While there are tax... Where are the tax cuts? The liberalisations, the reform agenda. Where's the house building? Where are the measures to unleash our newly independent economy? Where are the brave market reforms that we know have the power to alleviate the looming cost of living crisis? This government has a stonking majority. It's about time we see number 10 actually put it to use. Now, London Mayor Sadiq Khan has been making headlines for proposing a trial decriminalisation of cannabis and other Class B drugs in some parts of the capital. The proposals mean that Londoners in Lewisham, uh, Bexley and Greenwich, who are aged between 18 and 24 and have been caught with a small amounts of these uh, lower class level drugs, could be referred to courses and counselling instead of facing arrest. Although Khan's party is not unified on this issue, his party leader, Sir Keir Starmer, yesterday said, On the drugs legalisation, I've said a number of times, and I'll say again, I'm not in favour of us changing the law on decriminalisation. I'm very clear about that. Well, let's talk now to Andrew Boff, Conservative member of the London Assembly, about a proposal that will be making its way towards the London Assembly very soon. I, I'm, I'm aware that the, the mayor can't do this in and of his in and of himself, London Assembly members will have to vote to get this going, if I'm right. Will you be voting for this, uh, this trial decriminalisation? Not, not quite. It, uh, I mean, the London Assembly will have the right to interrogate the mayor about any of his plans uh, with regard to uh, a change in policy on policing. I mean, that is our job. But he can do it himself. Interesting. He can, he can, and, make, and he can make that decision himself. However, there is, a, there is a question about whether or not he has the powers to take operational decisions. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mayor Khan has on previous occasions denied all responsibility for certain controversial forms of policing by saying, well, they're operational decisions, they're not uh, policy decisions, which he's ultimately in, uh, uh, responsible for. It's, it's a very complex area. 
Indeed, and, and, and the uh, Metropolitan Police seem to come under fire just a, a couple of days ago for carrying out spot drugs tests outside certain nightclubs in London. Um, yes. This seems to be a, a bit of a, a zigzagging policy between, uh, on the one well, hand, stopping people in the street, stopping uh, people freely going about their business and testing them for drugs, and on the other hand, pursuing some sort of trial uh, decriminalisation. Where's the consistency? Well, I'm afraid this is indicative of the chaos of uh, Sadiq Khan's uh, uh, mayoralty, is that um, he's doing things for press releases, uh, but he's not actually managing the issues terribly well. And what he's in danger of doing is actually creating, uh, because of this chaos, because of people being felt at, left out of these decisions, he's actually creating arguments against the kind of drug reform that people like myself have been arguing for for many years. Um, and, and so I, I just wish if we were going to start reforming the, our approach to drugs, it was in more competent hands. But mm. I, I, I don't get to choose that. No, it's interesting that this is such a limited trial. Just three boroughs, only people between the ages of 18 and 24, and, and, and only yeah. for a, a, a small number of drugs as well. Is it your view that this won't really move the needle? Because it's interesting looking at public opinion, which has moved considerably in favour of decriminalisation of some drugs. Well, recent polls have indicated that 60% of Londoners think uh, this a, a kind of uh, legalization of cannabis uh, in in London would be supported, and so, you know, we are we are in a situation where the public is behind reform, and it's only politicians who are against it. Uh, but fundamentally, the way to get even more public on form is to stick to the data. That is, just to look at the evidence, see what's worked and what hasn't worked. And what we do know is the prohibition of cannabis, which is effectively what we have at the moment, doesn't work. And it exposes young people, not just to the risks of taking high potency cannabis, but also getting involved in those criminal networks that are currently involved in the supply. Um, I've always said that decrim is a halfway house, decriminalisation is a halfway house, mm. because decriminalisation, much as it uh, decriminalises young people and means young people won't get uh, a, a, a criminal record for, for, for small amounts of possession. It does absolutely nothing to destroy those criminal networks. And you're quite right. Why is it that when you're 24, you can carry around can cannabis, but when you're 25, you can't? That seems to be a, a huge inconsistency there. I, I, I've never quite understood why the Labour Party seemed to want to lower the voting age but raise the drinking age and have these very odd different, um, different or, or at least the smoking age and, and, and all sorts of age-based age inconsistencies. Well, it's been a fascinating discussion, Andrew Boff. Thank you very much for joining us here on much. the briefing. It's an interesting issue and one we will continue to look at. Well, just before we go now, we've just heard that the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, has tested positive for coronavirus and will now, of course, have to isolate again just before Prime Minister's questions. Of course, it wasn't that long ago that he had to isolate before the budget. Well, his deputy, Angela Rayner, will stand in for him this afternoon at Prime Minister's questions at the later time of 3 p.m. this afternoon. I, I could swear that Keir Starmer is, is the man who has had to isolate the most in Britain. The number of times he's had to isolate, my gosh. Well, I'm afraid that's all we have time for uh, today on The Briefing. Coming up, it's To The Point with Patrick Christie's and Mercy Maroki. But first, here's the weather. It's time to remind ourselves, there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Good morning. A pretty cold one out there this morning, even colder tomorrow morning. Generally, though, today, most of us will see quite a bit of blue sky and the winds easing down compared to yesterday. Now, low pressure is pulling away to the east. There is this weather front that's weakening further west, and we're kind of between the two weather systems. So, as I said, for many, it's dry and fine, but the winds are still coming down from the north.